I'm Jay Miller, and today on George Fox Talks, we're having a conversation about why doctors wear lab coats, medical ethics, and what it means to heal. I'm Jay Miller, and on today's episode of George Fox Talks, I'm joined by Joseph Clare and Tyler Tate to talk about an article they wrote recently called Love Your Patient as Yourself. Um, before we get into that, I'll introduce them and let them say a little bit about themselves. Um, Joseph is the executive dean of cultural enterprise here at George Fox University. Um, he's an associate professor of theology and teaches religion and ethics, Augustine. And Tyler Tate is an uh, assistant professor of pediatrics at Oregon Health and Sciences University, just up the road in Portland. Um, and he is a palliative care position physician, excuse me. And this summer, he's going to be moving on to Stanford University School of Medicine. So glad we could connect with you, Tyler, and you, Joseph, while you're still in the Northwest. Thanks for having um, me. <laughs> before we get into the article a little bit, which is about how we can, what it would mean to bring more love into medical ethics and the doctor-patient relationship. Um, this is an article you co-wrote together. So a theologian and a philosopher, um, a doctor, two different kinds of doctors, um, different expertises. How did you come to write this article together? And I don't think everyone always expects medicine and humanities as something to interact, but in, in fact, it's quite a fruitful relationship that you two are really mm -hmm. taking advantage of. Yeah. Yeah. I I spoke recently at my kid's school chapel and they introduced me as Dr. Claire. And then my <laughs> daughter came up and reminded me afterwards that I'm not a real doctor. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so it is it is unusual that two yeah. doctors would get together. I know, but, but with our powers combined, you know. <laughs> <laughs> How did we come to this, Tyler? Well, you know, um, so I did my um residency training in pediatrics and some ethics training at, up in Seattle, and then I was at Duke University. Um, to do my palliative care fellowship. Mm -hmm. And while I was at Duke, I got to know Stanley Hauerwas, who's a kind of prominent, well-known uh, theologian there, and um, started actually going to the Episcopal Church where he went and that his wife was a priest there, which was mm -hmm. pretty cool. And um, he, when I was leaving, we were having coffee, and he, uh, so we were just sort of mentioning, he's <laughs> like, uh, I know someone out in Oregon, and he pulled <laughs> open this little notebook, and and he went down line by line and found found Joe's name, who had done some work, who had studied at, at Duke under under Hauerwas, and then got online and Googled Joe, and then <laughs> said, you guys have to connect. And so when I moved out here to Oregon, I just kind of cold emailed Joe and came here, and we had lunch, and we just hit it off immediately, kind of a shared Lot, shared humor, shared vision of the world, and mm. set of concerns. So, and then this kind of paper grew out of our conversations about mm. some of the, the problems that we both saw with the ways that culture and theology and, and medicine uh, engage with each other. Yeah, the fire pit in my back backyard. So, a lot of great ideas uh -huh. come from. Yeah, it. yeah. generative spot. I yeah. think we had a you know. We both have done ethics, and we have grad degrees in ethics. Have mm -hmm. written on ethics, so there was overlap there. I think the central animating point in the essay about this this virtue of love, which is seemingly missing in some of the practice and teaching of professional medical ethics, as being a kind of like attentiveness to the humanity and other people, we can unpack that more. Mm -hmm. Seem to be central to some of the the erosion that goes on in medical ethical training is connected to, I think, some of the humanities formation and education and higher education. So we'll get into this, but the, the kind of lost perspective on what a human being is, what a human being is for, um, that it presumably should guide and animate mm -hmm. the work of education at all levels, whether you're forming uh, professionals for medicine or just you know, people to go out and serve the world in different ways. So I, I think there's an educative, like, uh, overlap in our visions, yeah. in which case for me, it was like mm. a foray into medical ethics and practice, which yeah. I didn't understand and learned a lot from, from in the process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That loss of a kind of vision or understanding of what a human being is or what a human's for, um, is kind of part of a larger narrative you guys have. That's kind of the exigence for the essay is the idea that the medical system is broken, or may not even the system, right? It's like medical care is broken, the way you interact with your doctor, which I don't think is that hard for most people to understand. I think even when you have a great experience with a doctor or medical system, you're still dealing with scheduling and billing and like the whole just apparatus and culture of kind of um, 
healthcare. And um, I think we all have experienced that on some level, but you have a really helpful way of giving some context for how we got there. How do we get to this place where we experience this loss of like humanity yeah. in this experience? Mm. Um, and something that really stood out to me in the essay was like, we can track that by paying attention to what doctors w wear, mm -hmm. right? So you kind of pick up in the 19th century um, with kind of like the, the family doctor who wears black and comes to your house with a black bag. Yeah. And you talk about how we end up with doctors in the 20th century wearing white lab coats. So how do we get from wearing black clothing to white lab coats as doctors and what does that mean yeah yeah it's funny because you think about many of the most famous pieces of art that depict doctors mm -hmm. um from you know the early 20th century 20th yes. century or previous mm -hmm. to that i was just in barcelona and went to the um, picasso museum mm -hmm. uh, i don't think we've been kind of uh, talked about this and you know picasso i think when he was 14 or 16 he won this huge competition um and it was for a, a painting of a physician. And it's very similar to the other famous piece called The Doctor. And it's this doctor in a coat like this at the bedside of a patient who's mm -hmm. gaunt and sort of, you know, emaciated face holding their hand. Mm -hmm. And that's the that was the vision of what a doctor did and what they mm -hmm. were all about. And then, you know, if we took a, if we did a, uh, a similar, and there there have been cartoons done about this. If what's the vision of the doctor now, it's them hunched over typing on their computer. like. Yeah. All, they're the gaunt ones now, mm. <laughs> you know? Um, so this white coat <clears throat> question, you know, I'm not a historian of medicine, but um, there was a, a, a set of pressures on medicine and those were both imposed by society, but also largely sort of the creation of um, the American Medical Association and other guilds of physicians who were trying to, what people, you know, don't know is there was actually um, in the 1800s and early 1900s, there were a lot of different kinds of doctors vying for power in American mm -hmm. society. Mm -hmm. um, osteopaths, pharmacists, and um, physicians um, were all trying to kind of secure cultural capital. Um, and at this time, there were all these wild in, uh, sort of discoveries being made in the laboratory, <laughs> you know, things um, kind of stretching across antibiotics and other um, discoveries. And so there was a lot of cultural capital being attached to the scientist who had this kind of a detached view of reality that could separate out the um, kind of messiness of uh, the human condition, mm -hmm. human emotions from the, the kind of distill it down, purify it to the scientific elements. And that was partly where the white coat um, was venerated as a scientist, and so physicians started wearing white coats. And there are other reasons for it, um, but it was sort of a fundamental kind of set apartness. Mm -hmm. um, Professionalization. More, yeah, I want to be more mm -hmm. like scientists. Yeah. And then um, doctors moved into hospitals more than into the home, and there was a whole set of social pressures that mm -hmm. created that. You know, mm -hmm. hospitals used to be places where poor people were cared for, where they mm -hmm. didn't have, who didn't have families, mm -hmm. um, and they ended up in hospitals. Um, and then slowly, for a lot of economic reasons, that that changed. But then doctors kind of took on this more um, sort of detached professional presence, and the the white coats sort of map matched that um, transformation. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's peculiar, though, when you think about it. Like, why are why do we why am I wearing this silly coat? It looks like a costume, sort of. <laughs> but then it's just what everyone was, has everyone does, you know. Mm -hmm. What do you take away from that like narrative of the history of? transit startorial transition for yeah. doctors yeah i mean i think the professionalization of a lot of the trades um <clears throat> over the past century that's led to different like guilds and codes of of conduct uh it makes a lot of sense i mean part of it is you're talking about we have a lot more people and a lot more people receiving medical yeah. attention and care so there's there's like benefits mm -hmm. to sure. the professionalization that you don't want to over uh, or underestimate, nor do you want to over or underestimate the importance of like scientific approaches to the curing of disease and sickness, right? right? Like um, my ibuprofen and all this stuff, like I'm taking it seriously. I'm grateful for it. And yet there's a kind of human to human basic agreement about care. And mm -hmm. I think you have that great Pellegrino quote in the article of like, you're the physician, I'm the patient. I have sickness. We're going on this journey together yeah. on this road out of yeah. illness. Yeah, it's, and a, it's accompaniment. You know? It's a company, right? And yeah. so, mm. how do you create in an increasingly like clean, efficient, bureaucratic, process oriented professionalization 
of a really fundamental human experience that's as intimate in some ways as friendship or, you know, obviously the deepest kinds of friendship like marriage or something. You're not going to say you're marrying your physician. That would be to be illegal. But it Mm -hmm. is to say the whole point of it is that there's a relational element. And of course, it doesn't always lead to success and health. And like the journey is not always successful. And I think this gets back to those fundamental eroding concepts about what human beings are, what the relationships are for. Because medicine is like, it requires a kind of moral animating quotient, which exceeds just the journey from sickness into health, because a lot of it doesn't end up that way. You work in palliative care. I mean, comment on it. Like the whole orientation of your practice is toward what we could see as lack of success, failure. And yet we take it to be like fundamentally central to our humanity and to our culture that we have professional and humane ways of dealing with these fundamental yeah. human experiences, right? And, and that was really um, what drove me to want to write this paper. Um, it was, you know, I experienced all of these years of medical education. And um, I don't know, you know, I've, I've, I've not been in the military. Um, however, for my friends who are were soldiers or, or veterans now, um, and when I, we talk about the kind of training and the kind of kind of uh, cultural pressures, mm-hmm. that's like this is what you are. Now you're going to dress a different way. Mm. We're going to give you a different language. You're going to line up um, in a certain way for these roll calls. All these sort of things that medicine has always has for, cent- for decades asked of physicians to do. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was training at Duke, they still made the orthopedic surgery residents every morning line up uh, in a wall and do roll call, which is sort of interesting. Um, uh, but, and then we do some ethics classes, some ethics, ethics lectures. Mm-hmm. And what I found, and we sort of write about this, mm-hmm. is that um, it was all about these dilemmas, these sort of peculiar, s- somewhat sensationalistic dilemmas. But there was very little to zero conversation around like, why the heck am, are we doing this? Like, which to me was felt like what ethics sh- should be about. It's mm-hmm. like, why should I keep caring? Why am I sacrificing all of these parts of my life to do this really hard work? And what is it about this sick and suffering person? And, you know, patient and suffering come from the same root um, is what, why should I care? Um, and so I never found that the language, the grammar of medical ethics was giving me the tools to understand my position in relationship to these people and this enterprise of medicine. And so that was really a, um, and when I kept coming back to like, what is this whole thing about? How should I think about people? You know, Pellegrino, which we have a, I think a line in the paper has this nice line that where he says, um, we, we, we should not forget that the images that pervade and saturate our culture about the patient mm-hmm. and about the doctor end up being the rules that we take for granted and base our actions upon. So, mm-hmm. you know, we're just sort of saturated in these sets of images around how we should think about these things. And I didn't find that the images that medical ethics was providing were very helpful. They were all about, you know, more rare choices or the use of the last ventilator um, and nothing mm-hmm. about like mm-hmm. why we should do this thing, mm-hmm. this thing called medicine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you identify in the article that kind of mindset broadly as principalism. Uh-huh. Could you talk a little bit about what principalism is, as kind of the dominant mode of medical ethics? And again, just elaborate a little bit more of the shortcomings you see in that approach. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it'd be, I'd love to hear kind of how you see that connected to the larger um you know, history of ethics, I think. So principalism mm. um, was um, an ethical, I, I don't, I think that Beecham and Childress who um, developed it probably wouldn't say it's an ethical theory, but it's a, a theory of medical ethics. Um, and what it proposes is that there are four principles of medical ethics. Um, and those um, are uh, justice, autonomy, beneficence, um, and non-maleficence, uh, non-maleficence, the legal or the ethical. Mm-hmm. And, um, and what those uh, generate are the kind of um, action guiding, uh, those are action guiding principles for mm-hmm. how clinicians or researchers, it sort of grew and grew it um, to occup- to kind of encapsulate how all of medicine and healthcare um, should ethically behave and treat each other. Um, and, you know, it actually grew out of something called the Belmont Report and a whole set of, I kind of talk about this in the paper, um, kind of came out of questions around research ethics that really had their origin in um, the Nazi doctor trials and these questions Mm. around like, wait, 
our sub research subjects mm -hmm. just kind of innate bodies that we can study, or do they have rights and um, kind of a pushback against paternalism? So there's really um, good reasons for principalism to arrive on the scene. Um, and what it has, unfortunately, we talk about kind of ended up in um, hmm. is a kind of decision procedure way to approach medical ethics. And I sort of feel like that's inevitable. I don't actually think it's the fault of principalism at the end of mm -hmm. the day. It's more um, what clinicians and medical schools have expected from ethics, which they want to function in the same way um, that other kind of rules of the body of physiology operate, which are pretty clear cut. And you can just kind of always consult the manual, the mm -hmm. algorithm, the flow chart. Mm -hmm. And principalism fit that bill at a time when, based on some really famous medical ethics cases, Karen and Quinlan, um, cases around you know, um, severely brain injured individuals mm. who we didn't know if it was okay to remove the feeding tube or not, because now we have feeding tubes and now we can keep people in sure. comas alive. And so all these ethics committees were then uh, mandated by the U.S. government and principalism was there around the same time. And it provided these four ideas that you were supposed to be able to weigh and balance against each other. And then the output was the right action. Mm -hmm. um, autonomy uh, de facto becomes the most sort of powerful and easiest um, principle to, to sort of identify and then uh, make manifest in a situation. Um, so all these ethics committees are springing up in hospitals. Principalism is right there, and then it just starts getting taught, and mm -hmm. um, it kind of has become the lingua franca of, of medical ethics today. And, and, you know, again, not faulting principalism, but I think it, it just gives us a really kind of slick way to get through problems mm -hmm. that would otherwise, I um, think, have a lot more social dynamics and factors mm -hmm. that we it helps us kind of ignore. Yeah, it's low friction, mm -hmm. which is useful when you're trying to have a mass <laughs> medical system. But hundred um, percent, yeah. But yeah, it can lead to a lot of alienation, dehumanization mm -hmm. of patients, um, maybe even dehumanization as doctors too. Yeah. You know, and lose like how do doctors suffer from this kind of model as yeah. well? Yeah, and the, you know, the, we were just talking about this. At the end of the day, this paper is a is a critique of. It's, 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 it's narrow. It's a critique of medical ethics, and the argument is that medical ethics um, doesn't do what we need from it. And so here's another way to think about these questions. Yet the ramifications, potential ramifications mm -hmm. of this argument are incredibly uh, broad and mm -hmm. get down to all these sort of economic factors about attention and time and efficiency. Um, mm -hmm. So... There's always this kind of totally. tension of like staying narrow, but also recognizing their broad implications. Yeah, and I think the rise of principalism, um, which is a really still the dominant framework, right, in medical ethics, Jim Childress at UVA, um, it, it came at a time in modern ethics where there was still like a deep desire to find a universal framework for ethics mm -hmm. that would free us from mm -hmm. the intolerant, you know, painfully, you know, faith-based sort of like medieval past and give us a universal description of the moral life and moral choices, mm -hmm. one side dominated by right theories of action. So you need to be like, do your rational duty. It's right for mm -hmm. you to do this because all universe, all rational people universally would do this thing. And then the consequentialist or utilitarian side of like, this will lead to a good outcome, you mm -hmm. know, reduction of pain and advance of pleasure for the most amount of people, most amount of good, most amount of people. It kind of splits the difference between that. It centers it in the rights of the patient to their autonomy yeah. over their own life and their own choices and then says you have to keep uh, the good of beneficence in mm -hmm. mind, what's going to lead to their good, but you also have to keep justice I think the problem is it took too much for granted. It presumed too much about the universality of those frameworks mm -hmm. and the underlying picture of the human person of human reason that undergirded those that I think is just frankly eroded. Like we are yeah. beyond an enlightenment universalist framework of rational yeah. duty mm -hmm. or consequences. And now we're at a point now where it's like, oh, you have to go back and actually educate for the underlying picture of the human person mm -hmm. for which any of these rational choice frameworks would even be relevant. You know, mm -hmm. that's yeah. part of the argument of the mm -hmm. article. And then the kind of constructive, so as we've done a good job, I think, of laying out some of the problems here, whether that's the kind of the downsides of professionalization and mass medical care or the kind of philosophical issues. Um, a lot of your paper, though, is kind of about retrieving kind of certain like philosophical resources for, mm -hmm. okay, how do we, how do we form doctors better? 
Um, and you gesture to the Hippocratic Oath, actually, so like ancient sources there. But I think things are really kick into gear when you bring in some Augustinian thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, I wonder if we could kind of slowly build up what your vision for an alternative medical care ethic could be. And could we start with Augustine and what you find compelling in his work that could be useful for doctors? Mm-hmm. Want me to go? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We found, we found that cool quote from the Roman physician Scribonius. Yeah, Scribonius. Uh, Scribonius. Yeah, what a name. Yeah, yeah my, my third child. <laughs> Scribonius. I can't wait to meet him. Yeah. <laughs> Edmund Pellegrino, I think, quotes him. And they're underneath the Hippocratic Oath and the kind of basic, like, do good and do no harm and balance mm-hmm. those two uh, basic moral principles in your care was this sense of, like, there's a virtue of showing humanity in the practice of medicine where your own humanity, your own sort of, like, what's most unique and precious about us as human beings needs to, like, recognize and resonate with the humanity of the sufferer yeah. so that there's, like, a an element of recognition that goes on. I think that that's, it's so uh, basic to the ancient ethical framework of oikiosis, weird sounding Greek word, but oikos, the Greek word for house or mm-hmm. the yogurt in my fridge at home is in there, but it's, it's all, it actually does capture, it's like you're bringing other people under the roof of your own house into the, your own kind of like sphere of self-concern and self-regard. That is the notion of moral maturation. And so it goes something like, as you grow and mature, oikiosis says, your own like cognitive self-awareness and affective self-awareness. So just mm-hmm. you can recognize other people like, oh, Tyler's a human being and he's seeing this whole interview right now, totally different than me. And he's mm-hmm. got his own perception. Is he speaking enough? Am I speaking to us? But also an emotional attachment yeah. and recognition. And then the idea is that you actually like draw people who are farther and farther away from you, like within the sphere of your own self-regard and concern. So I think that that's a cool framework. So what does that actually mean? The Christian tradition, Augustine inherits this and interprets that sense of showing humanity as an expression of neighbor love. I mean, Jesus Mm -hmm. is like unequivocal. You're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. Who's my neighbor? He's asked. He's given, he gives the story of the Good Samaritan, which is like a pretty like compelling, like people you may not even think are your neighbor (laughs) are your neighbor. So Mm -hmm. they're right there. Exactly. And so in stoic notions of humanitas within oikiosis, I think he senses the synergy of like, hey, uh, there's nothing human that's alien to me, the comic playwright right. Terrence says. And so that becomes like a, mm. an overlap he sees with the Christian notion of neighbor love and agopic love. Yeah. So how, how does that cash out in the, the patient physician? That's where Simone Weil and her notion of attention and then Iris Murdoch's notion of like a just and loving gaze yeah. toward another person. I think that's where you sense like there's a resonance between this really kind of abstract ancient philosophical framework and what needs to go mm-hmm. on in the patient physician relationship. So maybe you could talk about the attention side of it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's very complex. And so in a few minutes, it's hard to know where exactly what route to go. But I'll just sort of pick one, uh, like my ski line, and just go for it. Um, I think that um, I'm re- I was reminded frequently during writing this paper of um, kind of when Jesus is talking about the root, what is the root of evil? Mm. This idea that in some sense, greed and money um, are um, mm. going to always be the beast against which we must battle mm-hmm. in all various sectors of of life. And I think um, you know. Um, that is, in some ways, the villain that our um, ethic is attempting to to combat. And I think, um, and so, um, when it comes to asking the question of, okay, a busy physician, a busy nurse, a busy respiratory therapist mm-hmm. um, is encountering a patient for the first time or maybe the seventh time, um, what do they feel? What do they see? And then what do they do? So those are kind of some basic questions that are all about moral motivation and moral vision, like Iris Murdoch talks a lot about mm-hmm. a lot. Um, and so uh, for me, what kind of a, a constructive medical ethic um, that takes seriously um, the fact that, you know, um, uh, our character and our actions must be linked. Otherwise, I think ethics sort of becomes pointless and, and mm-hmm. really really vacuous. You know, um, what we want to develop are the kinds of people who can have a stable, um, compassionate, loving response to people who are suffering and who are in need. And then when the opportunity calls for it, are willing to both sacrifice some set of their own desires, maybe that's time or sleep or, um, mm-hmm. you know, whatever, 
and articulate why that's important to do for other people. So for me, like that's the outcome that I want to see. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, Stanley Hauerwas says that um, uh, love is the nonviolent, um, a, a, the nonviolent apprehension of the other as other, something like that. Yeah. Um, and so in this, we talk about all of these ideas of like doctor's orders or, you know, that um, I can mm. know a priori what is best for you, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, for people listening, one of the um, one of the concerns that a lot of folks have when we talk about this is, is that we're actually trying to be paternalistic again. It's like, oh, I know what's best for the patient as the doctor. Um, mm -hmm. I'm their friend. I'm their I'm friend. I'm not just the I'm expert. Their I'm their friend now. You exactly. Yeah. Um, and I love them. And so my love mm -hmm. therefore justifies my opinions. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's not the case. In fact, what we see is the opposite. We see in medicine is a detachment, a kind of fungibility of the patient, that a dollar sign that can set above their heads where we're just trying to work work through as many as we can. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we're trying to battle against. We're, we're actually trying to promote autonomy through relational autonomy, which yeah. is to yeah. say that um, to make the best choices for you, they must be authentic to you. Mm -hmm. um, but that authenticity is actually generated mm -hmm. through relationship because patients don't know yeah. what's going on in their bodies. And that's why there's a fundamental relationship of dependency mm -hmm. and vulnerability. And right. so to recognize that and then help cultivate that would be, that's sort of what we're looking for to develop. Yeah, that reminds me, I mean, another way of thinking about the place we've come to is not just a transition from doctors wearing black to wearing lab coats, but the view, the attendant view of we've mm -hmm. gone from having patients to having clients yeah. or mm -hmm. customers. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. Um, fortunately, that hasn't happened in the, our field of education. No, no. It won't. Um, <laughs> so we're holding out against yeah, that. Yeah, you're, if you but, uh, <laughs> drop the drawbridge, <laughs> don't <laughs> let that one pass. Um, but so it, kind of what you're saying is that we're, we're seeing people the wrong way. Yeah. And that mm. means we're not loving mm. them adequately. Mm. And you yeah. get this idea of, you use the like, you know, the great language of vision and sight as a way of knowing and a way mm -hmm. of loving that's obviously yep. coming out of Platonic tradition and Augustine, um, but it's also a big part of why you're drawn to Simone Weil and Iris Murdoch, yeah. um, which I thought was really interesting, you know, to, kind of to do this jump, but it's a jump that makes a lot of sense. And as I'm thinking about it, these philosophers are also thinking mm -hmm. at the time that medicine is becoming more professionalized. Yep. So could you just say a little bit about their, like what you take from them about love as a form of attention and why is it like, what do you think is valuable about them at that moment in kind of this mid 20th century moment, right when we're ramping up on professionalization? Um, mm. What are they seeing about society that's so valuable for us mm. to recover? It's a good question. Do the you Simone, have, yeah, you, jump, you know, jump the Murdoch, Murdoch better than I do. The Simone Weil essay we used was the essay on school studies yes, with yeah. a view mm -hmm. toward the love of God. She talks about attention elsewhere, but she has this amazing claim um, that the work you're doing in school, in learning, in education, where you focus your attention, mm -hmm. which we all like know and love and also hate at the same time, like <laughs> do the Latin exercise, mm -hmm. do the math problem, mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. on revising the essay. She's like, that's the same like muscle of the soul mm -hmm. that you're going to use when you go to prayer to like focus and like gather together mm -hmm. the mind and the heart and like bring your attentive awareness like to God. It's also the same muscle that you're going to use when you pay attention to another human being and you mm -hmm. bring your full. We talk a lot about now in our hyper technological age of like, I'm being present. You know, I put my phone down. Tyler put mm -hmm. his phone away before we had this conversation. It's like, I'm practicing self presence. I'm here. You're yeah. here. I'm here. I'm showing you that I'm here. She's like, that's the same thing going on in you, same soul muscle. And she like heightens it at the end that it's like, the attention of study, the attention of prayer, the attention to the other is actually made most um, challenging in the face of a suffering other person. Mm -hmm. Like that's the moment at which you're kind of like, yeah, I'm not, you just get antsy when you're around suffering, especially yep. if the suffering doesn't look like it has an immediate and easy relief. And she's like, your ability to pay attention to and bear with and hang with the sufferer and actually ask them, like, what are you, what are you going through? Yeah. She has this amazing line in there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. She's like, that is, we think that is an expression of the virtue of love for the practice of medicine in particular yeah. that we we just sort of latched onto. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Murdoch, how does she fit in that? Well, you know, um, I think one way that Murdoch, what Murdoch, one of Murdoch's projects in The Sovereignty of the Good um, is, in her book is um, to make the argument that you can't do or even think rightly about ethics unless you're talking about more, unless your language includes more than two words, what is the right and the good. So she has this uh, 
I think almost shocking sort of story about um, this woman who's, there's two ways that she describes to her mother-in-law to herself. I think that's what it is, her mother-in-law. Um, and it's uh, the same set of actions, but like different descriptions. And so she, and Murdoch ultimately kind of says, you, know, you can't think rightly about ethics unless you're using words like humorous or, mm. you know, ridiculous or like, I mean, you know, compassionate or gentle or forthcoming. These are all moral words. Um, and so um, it's it's words that incorporate mm. emotions. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the things that uh, Murdoch is identifying is that there are, uh, what a human being is, is really complex and it's mm -hmm. there's emotional components to it and mm -hmm. feelings. Like mm -hmm. feelings are part of ethics mm -hmm. because they, they uh, motivate our actions. And so, you know, there's a whole history that I don't think I fully get into of um, of medicine, uh, these sort of famous doctors advocating for us to be emotionalists. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I believe it was William Osler, who um, sort of the, one of the founders of American medicine at Johns Hopkins, who specifically had a whole protocol for like emotionalist doctoring and this kind of detached concern. Jody Halpern's a philosopher and physician who mm -hmm. talks about this detached concern. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm in some ways we're battling against mm -hmm. that. And I think Mur and, and um, Iris Murdoch is, you know, I don't want to completely put her in that battle along, right alongside us. Mm -hmm. But what she recognized is that ethics has become totally frozen and, mm. um, and it ultimately isn't getting the job done when it doesn't, recognize all of the kind of mm -hmm. the, the myriad complexities, fabric, interwoven fabrics and pieces yeah. of what makes human beings human beings. That's the wholeness of the person that has to ha be seen in ethics. It's not just rational brains, you know, crunching moral choices in the calculator. Mm -hmm. and I, I think, too, given our sort of Christian framework for thinking about these things yeah. as a wisdom tradition, of course, it has overlap with other moral traditions. Um, and things we can learn as well. But Jesus himself seems to embody a kind of moral force that mm -hmm. is attentive to other people. He saw people. It says that repeatedly in the Gospels. Mm -hmm. He saw them, and he had compassion on them, or the, his bowels of pity were moved. Like mm -hmm. There's this like mm -hmm. very visceral sort of response of Son of God, fully God, fully man, fully human, recognizing the suffering of the humanity totally. of others. And mm -hmm. it's in that it's in that like recovery of the vehemence of mm -hmm. the the passions to say, because again, the the parody is like, well, we don't want doctors and nurses and, and clinicians to burn out. So we need this detached sort of like objectification. It's actually the Actually, opposite. it's making us yeah, burn out. Exactly. Yeah, That's what I found stunning about your own sort of testimony. Yeah, say, tell us about well, that. Well, yeah, I mean, I think like, you know, we were just saying 2023 was the year of strikes in healthcare mm -hmm. in America. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is being driven by the sense of underappreciation um, of the work, for instance, that nurses, um, social workers, others are doing, which is which is true. Mm -hmm. um, and also, though, the feeling that you don't have time any longer to connect with patients. I mean, relationships yeah. are the meaningful part, most meaningful yeah. part of medicine. It's why look at every personal statement written by any healthcare worker. I ninety percent talk about the relationships that they long for and that they're able to generate in this profession, right. and yet. You know, it's sort of um, all, just always being kind of just pulled away from you, the time to do that. Yeah. Time, you make a point of in the mm -hmm. essay, is a moral category, mm -hmm. right? And so the atrophying of time in the medical relationship is also like a moral atrophy. Yep. It's mm -hmm. kind of, I think, one way of kind of saying Yeah, that Mark Mercurio, saying. who's at, uh, a pediatrician at Yale and an ethicist, has a great essay in the Hastings Report, uh, I believe, called uh, Time is Ethics. Yeah. It just states it flatly that, like, we can't do ethics unless we have time. Um, mm -hmm. And there's you know, a lot of ways you could sort of articulate that, but I think it just kind of stands on its own. Yeah. We're starting to put a little more, we're starting to move, I think, into like questions like, what does this actually look like mm -hmm. in practice mm -hmm. for physicians mm -hmm. and patients? And I think that's a really helpful point about the emotional quality or even the affective quality. Um, because like, I think, you know, we could walk away from this and think like, okay, like doctor patient relationships need to be more loving. Okay. Like mm -hmm. who's going to argue with that? But could you say a little bit more about like what it would look like, not for this to be put in practice. And you've talked a little bit about like the emotional piece, like what would that look like in practice with yeah. more emotion, more mm -hmm. like visceral compassion? Yeah. Um, yeah. Just some of the, could you flesh out like how this would change medical ethics and the doctor patient relationship yeah. if it were put into practice? 
Yeah. Well, I think that the most important thing is what you just said. It has to be practiced. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, when Iris Murdoch talks about like moral pedagogy, it's like a whole laborious transformation of vision, seeing people differently. Like, mm-hmm. um, so what would that look like in medical ethics? I think it's really tough. It, I'm, you know, I feel for people who have to structure medical education mm-hmm. because there's constantly more innovation happening in science that people are we're supposed to learn. Mm-hmm. But I think that like a this rec- is part of the problem too, right? Yeah. Like the pace of change. Mm-hmm. Yep. is like puts a lot of pressure yep. on the moral reflection mm-hmm. and formation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a reckoning coming down the pike because sure. yeah. um, we uh, you can only stuff so much in. Um, mm-hmm. And increasingly, I think prob- you know there will be um, uh, more splintering going on in terms of what you begin training for much earlier rather than having to learn everything mm-hmm. in medicine and mm-hmm. then begin to specialize sure. and subspecialize. Yeah. So I, I mm. and there are calls for that, uh, a lot of calls for that. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, I'll say, so I teach a class at OHSU, and it's one of the best experiences of my life. It's called Living with a Life-Threatening Illness. Um, mm-hmm. And in this class, 16 first-year medical students, we pair them with a person who is living themselves with a life-threatening illness. We call them patient teachers, and over the course of a, of a trimester-ish, um, they meet with them five to 15 times, mm-hmm. um, oftentimes in their homes, at coffee shops. These patient teachers, we call them, have things like ALS, like ALS and cancer and other really serious diseases that oftentimes they die through the course of this mm-hmm. several week class. And it's transformative for the students. And every single mm-hmm. one, we just finished it, wrapped it up, and I was reading through the evals, said, I have never in my entire life had an educational experience like this. It has changed how I see the world, how I see myself, and how I see suffering. Mm -hmm. And so, and why is that? It's because they realize that what it what it means to go through a life-threatening illness is so much more and different than they thought. It's Mm -hmm. so hard. And Mm -hmm. it you have to, it's all about having social support and it's all about reflection and memory and Mm -hmm. fear Mm -hmm. and hope and and I think that mm. helps the students realize that like they're just like this person and that person is just like them. And to be a good clinician, you have to both transform yourself to be caring. Health care requires some kind of care, which is an emotional aspect. It's not just something that is done. It's something you have to actually – you can't just care for someone. You also need to learn to care about mm-hmm. someone. Mm-hmm. Um But it also requires all of these economic and social forces. Mm -hmm. And so you can't really do medicine in America today well without thinking about all of the economic Mm -hmm. forces that Mm -hmm. are, you know, structuring how we see people. So I think that class is really special because it it generates – it helps these students learn – about themselves, about their profession through a relational lens, first and foremost, rather than tacking that on mm-hmm. at the end. And it's ethics in real time because they're it's actually true. having to put their body yeah. in certain places yeah. and experience suffering alongside people, this idea of accompaniment. It seems like the parallel, that's that's amazing, the parallel in our culture of like, we have an erosion of humanity recognition going on between citizens mm-hmm. in our culture right mm-hmm. now. And part of that's because the traditional sites where you would be exposed to people who are very different than you think differently, have different backgrounds, come from different places like a university, diversity is being weaponized yep. in those places, either from the left or the lack of diversity is being weaponized from the right. And it's being like made more tenuous because of the like digitization of mm-hmm. our lives and the mm-hmm. kind of like the technocratic, you know, screen social media version of relationship. Same. So we've lost the sense of humanity recognition. That's that I think is what is amazing about that class is you're setting up a place for the true recognition yeah. of humanity between the physician, the sufferer, between the patient teacher and mm-hmm. the clinician to happen so how how do you do that? How do you sustain those practices? Yeah. You know, um, it, because it seems like so. In addition to that, that's a practice set up so that the virtue of attention to the humanity of another person can be cultivated. Can be cultivated, yeah. in which your own humanity has to be called on. I also think we need a, the, a philosophical anthropology yeah. or a theological framework to ground that, because the irony in our culture right now is. What are human beings? Aren't human beings special? Dignity, rights, why are they so special? I don't know. They're just one more animal that got advanced in the landscape. That's right. like the dominant scientific view. Uh, the dominant technological view, you're like a really advanced meat machine that we're mm-hmm. going to like figure out how to like really wire you with machines and enhance you and get you to Mars and let you live forever on a computer. Like 
there's no anth shared anthropological mm -hmm, picture no. that's morally satisfactory to uphold the sense of dignity and rights that are like ethical inheritance. And so that's why returning something to something like be, human beings being made in the image of God in this precious uh -huh. way or being neighbors to be loved. And there's other, obviously other accounts of it, but you have to give some account because the preciousness of humans is connected to the sacredness of the vocation and call mm -hmm. to accompany people through their suffering and help yeah. them retain their humanity through what can be very like eroding, undignifying experiences, yeah. which you know better than I can. But I think that's that's the crux is we mm -hmm. don't have a kind of shared moral yeah. vocabulary. And to like, you know, what are people for? That's Wendell Berry, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Wendell Berry recognized, the writer Wendell Berry, that human beings are really special and they're unique. So is our environment and our cosmos, and yeah. we're part of it. You know, we yeah. can't actually understand ourselves without understanding the trees that um, allow us to continue to be breathe. human beings, yeah, to right. breathe, to mm -hmm. make produce. And so there's a kind of respect. And I actually think that that needs to be reflected more in medicine and medical education. There are a few universities that have departments of social medicine. And the whole sure. idea behind that is that mm. we're all, we're interconnected with our environments and that we have to think about the social dimensions of health. Otherwise we're going to fail the individual and their health. And I think every, you know, if I were, sort of coming up with these things. I think there would be longitudinal relationships for every single student mm -hmm. um, across the board. Mm -hmm. There'd be a lot more interprofessional engagement with nurses and doctors and social workers as they're being trained. Mm. Um, there would be massive amounts of the humanities kind of pouring over people to recognize like what kind of thing are we doing here mm -hmm. so that to help cultivate a kind mm -hmm. of philosophical anthropology and not trying to say that that's going to be a Christian one, but I think there are, you know, in a secular medical school, of course not. Mm -hmm. But there are there are better ways to think about human beings um, than just as these sort of soft robots that we I talk about in this paper. Um, and then mm -hmm. we would connect that to these really robust systems of social medicine that are thinking about, you know, what we're doing. I think from a political philosophy perspective, Martin Luther King Jr.'s work does, you know, from thinking about peace and community and the solidarity that we're all together. And then Paul Farmer's work, um, who is a, a physician who recently died and created something called Partners in Health, he talks a lot about accompaniment. He comes out of the liberation theology tradition, mm -hmm. that accompaniment through times of tribulation and hardship, both in the local and the global scale, that's the kind of metaphor that we should be using. So I, it's a lot about the language and the metaphors that we're sort of just mm -hmm. injecting constantly into our medical education schemes that I think we really can reform and mm -hmm. reimagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think going back to the kind of that idea of um, the oikos, the, what was the full term derived yeah. from oikos? Oikosis. Yeah. Oikosis, yeah. the kind of sense of connectedness. I yeah. hear you saying like in our training, we need less like siloed kind of professionalization for doctors mm -hmm. as this kind of like set apart group and more like connection with patients or something we were talking about earlier was like maybe more connection with nursing too. Because yeah. as I've been reading your article and thinking about your work, I think about these values and think like the ethic of care is so central to the nursing profession. Yep. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because And I think a lot of people, when they experience the medical system, right, you're very much experiencing nurses more than doctors yep. in some ways, right? Could you talk about the relationship, mm -hmm. maybe some of the tensions, but also what could productively come out of more of like doctors thinking about the nursing ideal? Yeah. I mean, I went into palliative care, which is uh, inherently interdisciplinary. It's sort of a profession, a mm -hmm. discipline that cares for people who have serious life-threatening diagnoses um, in pediatrics across the lifespan. We yeah. have a nurse practitioner and a nurse full-time on our team. Yeah. Um, there's a group of us. And so I uh, I went into something that is, like, by definition, the hierarchy is flattened a mm. lot in mm -hmm. comparison to other domains. So I think it's critical to have these different perspectives. I just see us all with different skill sets that mm -hmm. we bring mm -hmm. to the table. Um <clears throat> and, you know, in preparing this paper, I read so much medical ethics work, and you find care ethics, this kind of concern for loving relationships as mm -hmm. being fundamental to medicine, much more in the nursing ethics literature than you do in the medical ethics literature. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, like, we have to, yeah, work to have partnerships with our nursing colleagues all the time because they're off, you know, they're the ones who are um, – uh, getting some of the joys of the hands-on care and mm. also bearing the brunt of a lot of the hands-on care, which is part of the reason why so much moral distress is generated in nursing because 
you know, they'll feel like, why are we doing this to this patient? There's like, we're mm -hmm. treating them poorly or we're just keeping them alive, even though they're, you know, nearly brain dead, these sorts of things. Mm. So there's a lot of, um, I think recognizing each other's struggles and trying to think more about partnerships mm -hmm. is really important. I don't have a solution for that. It's not mm -hmm. something I've thought a ton about, but. Yeah. For the listeners out there, I just want to highlight that nursing <laughs> is the largest undergraduate major at George Fox now. Yeah, it's an amazing place to study nursing. It's academically excellent, but it has an interprofessional sort of mm -hmm. project embedded into it because we have a lot of allied health preparation. More than that, I do think we're like unabashed about the framework for neighbor love and patient care here in a way that you can be in a faith-based mm -hmm. you know, organization. Obviously, they pass the NCLEX and, and know the code of ethics, but their fundamental vision of what a human being is and is for and how suffering fits in is shaped by the worldview here. And I think we'll probably increasingly see the preciousness of that as yeah. we move forward in the practice of medicine because there's not a lot of like competing moral vocabularies ready uh -huh. to fill the void, I don't see. Yeah. yeah. I was just going to say, and I think like we have to remember that medicine is both special and unique. And maybe, you know, we sort of touch on some of the unique ethical features mm -hmm. of these sorts of relationships, but also it's just part of a whole politic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, medicine... Mm -hmm and law and, you know, nutrition and then all economics, all these forces, yeah. it's not, it's part of like a whole vision, mm -hmm. a whole cultural vision, a mm -hmm. cultural enterprise. Like yeah. medicine mm -hmm. is going to be a product much more than it thinks of itself as. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's why thinking way, way more upstream is really important um, yeah. from an educational perspective, from a perspective of politics and, and mm -hmm. social dynamics. Yeah, I think that's a great place to kind of maybe ask a final question that goes to sort of a big picture thing and thinking about, you know, what you're really kind of asking, I think, is how do we get back to like healing, you know, and yeah. not just maybe fixing, um, you know, to get away from the mechanistic back yeah. to the kind of organic kind of vision. Um, and yeah, we use, we were talking about the doctor patient relationship, um, but we use healing in so many other ways, Yeah, right? We talk about healing the body. We also think about healing our emotions, our spirits, mm -hmm. think about healing the earth, that environmental aspect, think about healing like just division or any kind of brokenness. So I'm curious for both of you on the other side of writing this and on the other side of this conversation, you know, what do you take away from almost the kind of doctor patient relationship as a figure of the broader task of healing that we mm. both need to like undergo ourselves and give to others. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm just brought back to what I think was one of the most influential pieces of writing that I've ever encountered, which is an essay by Wendell Berry called, I think it's called Health is Membership. And mm. it's, he talks about healing and health. And he mm -hmm. says, you know, that how can we expect to be well? How can we expect to be whole? Which he says, healing and wholeness. Mm -hmm. He sees as relatively synonymous. He says, when we don't care for each other and we don't care for our environments and the environments in which we're growing. So I think mm. um, there's a kind of like um, holism that um, we, we have to always be um, on guard against. I think like kind of the, the work is never done. You know, that's mm -hmm. the, I think for me, that's a, something I really took mm -hmm. away from working on this is the work of ethics is never done. It's not yeah. like you can get the theory right, the medical ethics theory right, and then go home and leave it. Mm -hmm. No, ethics is constant, and um, human nature will constantly be sort of drawn towards things like money and greed and power. And mm -hmm. um, what we have to do, for those of us who have the calling to do it within healthcare, is sort of devote ourselves to being battling on that and out narrating it in, mm -hmm. in some way. And... Um, and then have as much joy as we can in the process, I think. So I think like thinking about health and healing and wholeness as a kind of solidarity with each other and with our environment, that's the model that I think we can sort of aim towards. And what would it look like to have schools and residencies that are designed in that model um, rather than the for-profit model that sure. is so dominant in, in American society today? Yeah. Yeah, that's... Such a great question, and it's, it speaks to the wholeness. I think one of the challenges for our culture is the rabid individualism, um, which had some the rugged individualism, you know, which is the American spirit. It's had some beautiful things and political expressions and democratic intuitions, but I think it's bottomed out in some ways in a mm -hmm. very individualist, isolationist liberty for myself, get off my lawn 
kind of sadness and loneliness in which mm-hmm. you've seen the erosion of the fabric of those common uh, sort of whole enterprises, which include our health, which include our politic, which include the land. And unfortunately, an individualism yoked to a sense of vocation, which is about wealth and power and influence, doesn't lead you to want to go into the caring professions or mm-hmm. education or government, some of these, the slow, painful, right. long work right. that includes dealing with sickness and division yeah. and learning and raising kids and mm-hmm. all these things. So I, the beauty of oikiosis, though, is that it's a philosophy that's like maximally wide in terms of a universal ethic to care for every other human being insofar as it's within your your grasp as your neighbor, as another human being. But it also begins very locally, you know, to not be too cli- cliche, but it's mm-hmm. a here and now mm-hmm. sort yeah. of philosophy. Mm-hmm. It's like you're tending the joining of your own soul and your body and your own health. You're mm-hmm. tending your own household and the friendship of marriage and children. Mm-hmm. If you have mm-hmm. that, you're tending your own neighborhood in mm-hmm. some ways. And that, I think, is Wendell Berry's kind of key insight that he's made much more popular and beautiful through mm-hmm. his writings of like, any of these philosophical frameworks mean nothing apart from like, how did you say hi to your neighbor today on the yeah. way out? And like, mm-hmm. did you lend a hand when they were pushing their car back in the driveway? I mean, that's like, that is oikiosis. Yeah. That's how your own self-regard expands. It doesn't just go online, see a suffering person across the world, donate some money at the end of the year and call yeah. it good, right? So it's it's that moral maturation that goes from the very uh, immediate to the yeah. the... It, far, I, yeah. I agree. It reminds me of Howard Wass's kind of famous line that uh, to bring it to Christianity to our home, um, that the church does not have a social ethic. The church is a social ethic. Mm. And that's aspirational, but that's sort of what you're talking about, you know? Exactly. Um, Feels very aspirational. That actually is in Augustine's. I know we got NJ, but there's always time for Augustine. But he, <laughs> bring he, us he, home, he, he brings home. He has the the like Aristotelian Stoic framework of the concentric circles of like the yeah. self, the soul, and the body, the household, the political community. You know, the community of all human beings. But then, unlike the Stoics or Aristotelians, he's got this thing called the church, which is like like more immediate than family mm-hmm. in some ways. And so far as you're drawn into this community as children of God, it also calls you into like some people will call them not into the normal concentric circle pattern away from marriage toward service to God and celibacy as it was for Paul in first Corinthians 17. So he sees the church as being this like community that actually can heal um, and disrupt some of mm-hmm. the concentric circles in yeah. a way. And I think that idea of the local church and church participation, exodus from church, online church post-COVID, I think exactly. It's very aspirational to say yeah. the church is the social ethic, um, but we have to cling to that. That is that is the fundamental insight of a Christian yeah. appropriation. And you can't chaosis. give up the vision. You can't. Yeah, you got to hold exactly. on to it. Sure, right. I think, I think early in his papacy, right, for, Pope Francis talked about church as field hospital, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So that's kind of a nice nice tie in there to kind of think about how these kind of models of care, which you've elucidated well and raised so many questions for me to think about, continue thinking about, um, yeah, to think about the way we're always being invited to care and to receive care as yeah. well. So thank you so much for the deep thoughts on this. Um, deep thoughts, Jack Handy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And now we'll have some jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks, Jay. Thanks thank for you. having us. This video podcast is a production of George Fox Digital. To find more material like this, you can subscribe to George Fox Talks on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you listen to podcasts. Our team really appreciates your feedback in the form of likes, comments, and reviews, and we'd really love to hear what you think. To sign up for our weekly email list and to keep up to date with the latest episodes and publications, you can check us out on the web at georgefox.edu talks. Thank you for listening. And we'll see you in the next episode.